Bob, let me start with you. you st I think you took over Barclays in 2010 or so, so just, yeah. just as we were getting into the great financial crisis. Uh, what are the differences and similarities? I mean, Larry was careful in saying we're not yet yeah. the layman, but we may be a bear servants. I mean, there's similarities in terms of fear, uh, but I think there are more differences. I mean, 2008 was a banking crisis. It was a liquidity crisis. It was a solvency for many institutions in, in financial services. And, you know, particularly in the U.S. today, I don't think we could have a stronger uh, banking system. Uh, from capital levels and you know, all the way through. Um, and I think right now, obviously, it's a health crisis, number one. Uh, but in terms of the impact in the economy, uh, my sense is that we are dramatically underestimating the impact in the near term in terms of the economy. Um, and we may be overestimating the medium to long term, and that's very dependent on um, any resolution to, to the health crisis. Um, I think, secondly, um, while this isn't a, uh, um, I don't think anyone would think of this as a banking crisis, one of the things we're all trying to figure out is how can the banks be part of the solution? They're definitely not part of the problem. Uh, and then lastly, I'd say, David, is I think, you know, when I look at the fault points, um, if I look down the road, I can easily envision a significant bounce in the equity markets because, you know, I think um, uh, the near-term impact on the economy could potentially unwind over time. But I think when you look at the low end of the U.S. dollar corporate credit market, um, I think that may be more permanent in terms of, of um, loss of value. So, Rick, I wonder if one difference might be uh, not very advantageous, and that is this. We had a level of cooperation, even across the aisle in 2008, and between fiscal and monetary authorities uh, that we seem to lack right now. Uh, people say we should be coordinated. It doesn't feel very coordinated what the government's doing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, first of all, I would say one thing, that crises tend to bring people together, and so I think you'll see a bit more of that, but you're right, heretofore, you haven't really seen that. Listen, I, I think, you know, people like to, you know, say in the markets, we like to grasp on the history because it gives us a pretty good playbook for how to think about this going forward. But, you know, it's interesting. Every time you have one of these disruptions, it's different than the mm -hmm. one before, and they're usually the reason why they're so potent in terms of how they hit the markets is you can't really go back and say, how did this play out before? The things that are significant are, I mean, this is an exogenous shock of, of significant proportion. Listen, we've never seen this before. We have people working in different offices. What is liquidity? How do people interface with one another? And that is really uncertain. So, you know, we've got to work through that part of it. But I think what Bob said is right. It's not a, it's not a leverage problem, per se. And the other thing that I think is significant about this one, and part of why we'll talk about you need that coordination, you need fiscal policy. The markets are not going to stabilize until you have something tangible from a fiscal policy point of view. Listen, the economy up to this point, and it's different regionally. Europe was still, I would argue, more abundant in terms of in terms of growth. But the U.S. economy was actually surprisingly this late in whatever whatever business cycle there is, was particularly strong. You look at hiring. You look at where we were from a housing point of view. Uh, retail sales was good, and even even manufacturing was was doing okay in a secular decline. Now it's like, how do you get from here to there, and how do you get to the other side? Listen, I'm more enthusiastic about, I agree with Bob said, there's going to be some permanent tail to it, particularly in the credit markets. But this is something, we've got to bridge what is a really deep uh, slowdown in the economy. And you have some sense that particularly Asia, particularly China, and the U.S., there is some real vibrancy of those economies. We just got a bridge from here to there, and, the, and that is uncertain how we get there. Bob, are you worried that the markets are not responding in ways you might have expected? We had last week the Fed cut 50 basis points. Markets went down. They didn't like it at all. This week we had the Fed step up on liquidity and inject liquidity. Initially they reacted, and then they came off again. Are you worried that maybe the buttons that we're pushing are not getting the reaction we would expect? Y yes and no. So I think it's a tale of, of two sides. I, I completely agree with what Rick said, is what we need more than anything right now, if, if we're correct that the near-term impact on the economy is going to be severe, we need fiscal stimulus, and particularly in Europe. Having said that, um, I think what the ECB and the Bank of England have done uh, in terms of providing liquidity, making sure banks have money to lend, particularly in Europe, where the banks are nowhere near as healthy as they are in the U.S., um, more asset uh, acquisition programs, and uh, in the case of the U.K., um, uh, both uh, Governor Carney and incoming Governor Bailey uh, have uh, reduced uh, one of the buffers so that banks have more uh, capital to lend to small businesses. And I, I compare and contrast that to 2008 when uh, President of the ECB, Trichet, raised rates. 
uh, and the governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, was, was focused much more on moral hazard. Mm. And I think the U.S., under the Bernanke moves in TARP, um, really stole a march at that time. So I do think, although I would like to see all of the central banks come out in a little bit more um, coordination, uh, but I must say the actions taken by the Fed around the, 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 the stimulus in the repo market and what's been going on in Europe, uh, in the U.K., I think are very strong moves. But, Rick, if it does require fiscal, where is the fiscal at this point? Because we don't seem to have any agreement in Washington. Uh, yes. We have, again, Madame Lagarde saying we need some fiscal help over here in Europe, and Germany says, well, maybe, we'll see. <clears throat> you know, there, there needs to be, I mean, one of the things that happens is you need to take out the bazooka in terms of how you go at this from a fiscal point of view. And by the way, a lot of these, a lot of these dynamics, if you spend the money, there are, ten, there are tangential benefits you get from it. So if we spend a tremendous amount of money on things like health care, you actually make discoveries in other places. That money, actually, there's a multiplier effect that gets into CapEx and R&D, et cetera. We need to spend it. We need to take out that bazooka, and we need to do things around state and lo local government funding, et cetera. Where is it? It's hard to say. I mean, Europe's more difficult because of politics, because of some cultural dynamics around it. It needs to be bigger. What Italy did, 1% of GDP is a good number. And, you know, if you think about it, if the U.S. put 1% of GDP or more into this, that is where you start to get some velocity. That's where you start to get the real attention of the markets. Bob, is it more important that you spend the 1% or is it more important where you spend the 1%? I mean, if you had that discretion right now in the United States, where would you put the money? So I think it's the right question. I, I completely endorse what Rick said is we need a bazooka. And I also endorse it's much harder in Europe because of the lack of leadership in, in many of the key countries and the lack of leadership of Europe as a whole. But they have been really lagging in fiscal stimulus. But if it could be aimed, um, I would say, number one, uh, those families that are most impacted, particularly, you know, single-income families or dual-working families or low-income families who have the kids all of a sudden home from school right now, uh, I think, secondly, you know, health care. Uh, and, and making sure that we're doing everything we can possibly do to focus on the real issue here, which is the health care um, uh, issue around uh, coronavirus. Um, and then there's other select places. I think we're going to see real weaknesses in some of the U.S. life insurance companies because of lower rates, widening credit spreads. We're clearly going to see challenges in the travel industry, hotels, aircraft, uh, 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 air flight. Uh, so I do think it should be targeted, David. Uh, but I, I like uh, the way Rick phrased it, which is, we need a bazooka. Oh, so that sounds encouraging. You spent a fair amount of time in Washington. Mm -hmm. You talked to these folks mm -hmm. in the administration. Do they get it? Do you think they're moving in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think they are, you know, yes, uh, I think so. I think they're generally uh, addressing some of the issues or talking about some of the issues. But I think you need to have a seven or eight step plan, and it needs to be pragmatic, diversified, and thoughtful about where it goes. There are things, a lot of the, what's going to happen are supply chain disruptions. That you need to get at liquidity and that you need to get at transportation, and you think about what's going to happen now is, is people like to. There's some things nobody's going to have a second dinner because they missed the dinner. Yeah. But if you didn't get to go on your trip that you were going to make in March or April, gosh, you know what? I'm still going to try and go on that trip. You'll start to see that take yeah. place, but you need to kickstart that and get that fiscal. And listen, I, people are skeptical, and you know, rightly so, I guess, about do you get Congress behind it? It's very difficult. Listen, a lot of these initiatives, the way Bob said is right, if you, if you, a broad health care initiative, a broad initiative to help small business to, you know, around supply chain disruption, gosh, that's pretty hard to vote against. Yeah. And so I, I'm more, you know, think about, like Bob was saying, you go back to TARP or you go back to some of these initiatives, you know, you got everybody together yeah. and, and it happens. And I, we got we to just get the ball rolling there.